Hi there, welcome back to the channel. Welcome to the next video on the continuation of the restoration of the uh, CRF320, Sony CRF320. And I've got some great news, as you probably can uh, figure out from what I was doing here, and the look on my face. Shortwave is working. Shortwave is working. Uh, it's not failing intermittently anymore. It was uh, when I left off last. I was waiting for components and all that sort of thing. As it happens, I didn't need to change that many components. Certainly not the ones I thought I'd need to change. But it's working, and I can't get this stupid smile out of my face. I've been playing with it for some time um, this week, and it is fantastic. I am really, really chuffed with this, and I want to show you the result. Stick around and see what it is that uh, I needed to do to get the shortwave back. I'll leave that as a mystery. The other mystery is, what did I do regarding alignment? Stick around and look at that as well. It might surprise you. And the other mystery is, what are we going to do about the antennas? But Maybe that won't be answered just yet. So, if you enjoy this sort of thing, and if you haven't been put off yet by my stupid grin, stick around and enjoy the video. She's naked again, but for a good cause. Really for a good cause. Now, um, when I left off last time, I had two issues. One was this thing was not uh, constant. It wasn't absolutely stable. It would work for a while, and then it would just cut out again, and I would have problems finding it. I'd change to another megahertz band, and I'd pick it up, and it was all going all over the place. The other issue was that element was failing, so I took this one step at a time. And by the way, if you're wondering why it's naked again, it's because I took the front off when I did the video on the, on the gears, which I posted uh, this week. So what did I do first? I wanted to tackle the top and get that out of the way. There was two issues here. One was a little light. The next issue was a little bit more tricky because I was getting skipping um, frequencies here. I would get, uh, I would tune this say, say to 15 megahertz, and I'd be picking up a 40 megahertz signal. I demonstrated that, but now this thing is working beautifully on all bands. I can peak it on all bands. That's the um, amateur band, upper side band. And it's working very well. Obviously, it depends on the time of day. This is uh, still afternoon, so it's better on the upper frequencies. And it's receiving very, very well. So what did I do? What did I find? Why was this happening? My first thought was that it was the switching, as I mentioned. I was convinced this thing had something to do with the switching, and I checked all the switches, I checked all the contacts, I resoldered all the contacts, and it made no difference at all. So then I went to the other part of the circuit that has to do with uh, frequency, and that is the actual synthesizer unit. And I really, really thought I was going to get away without having to remove this board, but that proved impossible. What did I find? Well, I found that when this thing went off, when it cut off, let's say I was receiving on the 16 megahertz band, right? And it cut off. I found that if I sprayed some um, cold spray onto this chip over here, this one, I think it's IC1003 or 4. When I sprayed some cold spray, it suddenly came back to life. Then it will work for a while, and then it will go down again. So I thought, okay, it's got to be this. So I'm going to have to find a way to remove this and replace it. So what I did was I ordered two new chips. I found exact replacements for this chip, and I ordered some. They haven't arrived yet, but they're on their way. So I decided to prepare this board to get those chips. And I took this board out. I followed a lot of the instructions that Mr. Carlson's lab provides. Check the underside, and the underside of this thing was quite bad. It was, yeah, a little bit like his. It was dirty. It was um, full of uh, old flux. It was, well, none of the solder joints looked like they'd been tampered with, so I don't think anybody was in here. But there was a lot of gunk in there, and sometimes, sometimes, that gunk can actually damage the function of the circuit. I've had that before, especially with high frequencies. It might not have been the case, but ultimately what I did was I removed everything. 
or I removed the old solder, I resoldered the whole thing, I changed the uh, electrolytic capacitors, this one's still got to be pushed in down there, and there are, there's one, two, three, changed those, there's one on the outside there, four, and I decided to put, uh, to take these chips off, and I decided to fit sockets on here, so that um, I could easily put the new chips in when they arrived. Just to keep it working, or trying to keep it working, I put the old chips back, and guess what? This thing's been working flawlessly for ages. I can't get it to fail, which is a good thing, but ultimately I'd want to see what, um, you know, if those chips were the problem. I don't know if they were the problem. I really don't know, uh, because by just simply by cleaning, cleaning everything up and, and redoing solders and touch-ups, nothing was absolutely broken. But obviously, I did something that made this work, and I'm not going to question my luck. I'm just going to say thank you very much to the gods of repair. I got this working, and it's been working for some time now. So I'm actually thinking of leaving these original ones in here. I've got sockets in place, which is great, because then I can just remove these chips and uh, put the new ones in. I've got to sold, solder the shield back to the bottom there and cover this up, close this up, and start finishing off this project. So that's what I'm going to be doing next, and um, I don't know. I really can't tell you why this thing suddenly started working, but it did. And uh, I guess the lesson to learn here is change the electrolytics. It might have had to do with electrolytics. I've measured them. They're not that bad. I mean, they're old, but um, the measurements don't uh, tell a very bad story. But something went right. So I often say that sometimes you're good and sometimes you're lucky. I think this is another one, another case where I just got very lucky. So what is next? Well, next is I need to finish this up. I need to close this up. I need to clean up the sides, put them back, put the top on, clean the back, put the back on, basically finish this off. It might have to be opened again if for some reason the problem comes back. I, know, <laughs> I can't be sure. I'm going to be testing it for a long time. But then there's another issue, and that is the antennas that are missing. There are two antennas on this radio. These are very special antennas. They, they are antennas that you, you sort of push in and it clicks in place, which is great because it sort of becomes countersunk. This one doesn't have an antenna here at all. It's got one on the other side, which is broken at the top. So I've got to do something about the antennas. And I've been looking at antennas for this, and they are astronomically expensive. The ones that I, well, one that I found was about 170 bucks and it was broken. The end was bent or something. So I've spoken to my friend and, and I've actually come up with an alternative. And let me show you what I mean. This is an antenna from the Eaton 750 Elite, which is the uh, copy of the Grundig 750 Pro, which has been copied as well by Texan S2000. And this antenna is quite a good one. See, it's a one meter long antenna which probably is not as long as the original on this particular radio, but it's got all the trimmings. And these antennas are still available. I found a supplier on eBay that sells these things as replacements for the Texan S2000. Mind you, it makes sense. It's a fairly new radio, so it makes sense that the new antennas are in place. Now, the, um, this antenna will have to be adapted slightly because the original inside the case is longer. But now with my 3D printer, I can actually print an adapter that will lift this up and make it all possible to connect this properly. So I think, and I've, I've taken this one out of my 750 because I wanted to see what it looked like. And it looks pretty good. It looks really good. So I'm going to order two of these and um, replace the original antennas on this radio with these antennas. Again, as I said, it's not an original. I'm not trying to... Uh, Hide the fact that you can't sort of clip the, click this and it jumps up. It, that won't work. But it'll look pretty good and it'll look almost original. And that's what I'm going to do. The other thing is the, uh, the back is just going to get cleaned up. And I'll show you the result when I've got everything put back together. Maybe even before the antennas arrive because I'm just going to order them now. They still cost about 30 bucks each. So they're not cheap. But they're a lot cheaper than the uh, than the unobtainium ones for this particular radio. I'm, I'm not prepared to, you know, spend that kind of money on, a, on one antenna that is bent and maybe not get a second one. It just doesn't make sense. I think it'll be uh, obviously something that you can replace in the future, but it'll be a, a good temporary solution and it will look complete and it will work well. I mean, this thing is supposed to work with a communication receiver, the Texan or the uh, Grundig uh, 750. So 
that's where I'm going with this. So the next stage I was preparing for was the alignment of this radio. I thought this was going to be great fun, a lot of things to twiddle, a lot of things to perfect. I know the instructions are good, so let's go look at them, right? These instructions are incredibly complete. They tell you what you need. RF signal generator, AM RF signal generator. You need a sweep generator, FM and AM, marker generator, frequency counter, blah, 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 blah. And then you need to build this detector, which basically just allows you to detect the signal. It does the, um, the, the actual detection. In other words, it rectifies it, gives you a DC voltage, I presume, yeah, or differential voltage. And it uh, represents a very, very, very light coupling. If you look at this, three picofarads, it's like, it's like putting your nose there. It's sniffing the signal rather than actually dragging it down, which is great. And it tells you do not just touch the uh, VFO block, which is uh, set at the factory. And this has got to do with the tracking across the band. You don't want to mess that up. And then it starts telling you what to do. Now, here's the first problem. This is the main board. The main board is very difficult to get to. You can see it. But to get to specific spots on the main board is a challenge. There's a lot of shields on there. Some of them have got holes marked on there so you can get through. But then you've got to, there's nothing that is normal. There's nothing that you just put a probe to, right? Everything you put, you, you, you detect, everything you feed in has got to be through an, a resistant capacitor. Fine, that's understandable. Everything you detect has got to be through a probe or otherwise. And getting to these places is incredibly difficult. They do give you all the instructions. They are very, very clear about what you're supposed to do. That is not the issue. The issue is getting to these spots and making sure that, um, well, actually, these are accessible. What am I saying? Yeah, the actual um, cores are not that bad, but actually finding where to solder. You need to solder your, uh, your uh, probes or your detection points here, because otherwise I don't see how you're going to be able to do it. And then we get on to the tracking. So the coverage, the, the frequency tracking, everything is very, very well explained. Everything is complete, I think. I'm talking about this from what I'm seeing here. But in my opinion, if you're going to get into one of these, you know, put four or five days aside, put a cap on your head so you don't scratch all your hair off. And maybe, just maybe, you'll get it right. So what do you do instead? Well, you do what I decided to do. I decided to check how good it was as it is, right? I mean, before you start thinking about changing something, let's see what it is you're trying to improve, okay? So I started doing some comparisons, and the comparison that I did was with the uh, the Yetron 750, which is like the Grundig Satellite 750, and this thing was better than the 750. I've got to say something. This thing is the most sensitive receiver as it is without any alignment. I believe that I've ever had on this bench. This thing is picking up stuff that the others just sniff at. There are signals on the 750 and even on the, I did it on the satellite 3400 as well. I tried everything to try and compare signals. I would set up a particular station or set up a tuning and, and compare the three. This thing was beating them all on short wave, on long wave, on medium wave. FM is really pretty good anyway on all of them. But this thing is picking up so many stations last night from the Canary Islands on, on, on FM that I don't think I've heard them all before, you know? So I thought, well, why the hell am I going to mess with this if it's perfect? What I want to do is make sure that the alignment is good because, you know, all this mechanic, all the mechanics that we looked at, the gears, this gear, you know, aligning this thing, putting the spring tension on the, on the back of this uh, tuning knob and, or the tuning uh, shaft, all that has got to do with a mechanical and visual result. So I wanted to check how good that was. I'm going to show you the result. Admittedly, I had to take the cover off again because there was a slight adjustment that I needed to do. But the adjustment was purely mechanical, not electronic, not really alignment. It was a shift that I had to do on this one. So I'm going to show you now. I'm going to put this on and I'm going to show you just how accurate this thing is. OK, let's start at 88. It's right in the middle of those two eights. I'm going to put my um, FM generator to 88. I've got a tone on there. I have purposely brought the antenna all the way in, all the way in, because there is a station in Madeira on 88, and I don't want to hear it. I want to hear this. I'm going to put the RF on, and I'm going to show you what happens.
There is 88. Okay, let's go to the end of the band. Set this guy to 108. RF on. Volume. See that? If we try, say, 100. This thing is near as damn it perfect. FM is perfect and the uh, sensitivity on this thing is incredible. It is incredible. Let me go to the AM. I'm going to put the signal in through the signal generator. I'll put it on the antenna at the back and we'll see how the, uh, the medium wave and long wave do. I've got a signal coming in at 530 kilohertz with a tone on it. Put the volume up. Let's go to 530. See that? 530 exactly. Let's go to the other end of the dial. 1.6 megahertz. There it is. Perfect. Try the middle somewhere. Like 1 megahertz. There it is. Perfect. Let's just do, say, 320 on long wave. Three twenty, exactly. This thing doesn't need any alignment here at all now. This was just the physical rotation. In other words, the spread across the dial was perfectly aligned internally, electronically. The physical position was the only thing I needed to worry about. And of course, I had to worry about it because I removed everything, right? So you need to put it back. Let's look at the shortwave. Now, shortwave has a peculiarity. The actual RF alignment, the RF alignment, in other words, the dial alignment of the uh, shortwave is really only done over the one megahertz span because the, um, the tens and the units, in other words, the 10 kilohertz and the one kilohertz is actually selected physically, right? It's not really tuned. You then tune from uh, 0 to 999 on the band, right? So now I'm feeding in a 10 megahertz signal, okay? And let's see where we are. There we go. If I try and get it on here, I need to increase the amplitude of the signal because there's something I need to say about this guy. 10 megahertz, spot on. It is near as damn it spot on there as well. So let's look at 999. So if I go to 10.999 megahertz, there we go. And it's just under the, 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 the thousand there. If I put it there, there's a thousand. That is perfectly aligned as well. So this thing is great. Let me put it on 10.5 megahertz. There's 10.5, perfectly aligned there as well. Remember there's a bit of parallax with the camera angle, but it is spot on. So this thing is working incredibly well. Everything is working well on here. This uh, scale adjust, by the way, is, has been set so that it goes the same amount to the left and right. But it is perfectly aligned, so we leave it in the center. The antenna tuning, when you set it to... Actually, I was doing that without actually... Uh, without actually... Let me do that. RF gain. This wasn't even perfectly aligned. There we go. Our meter is now showing a response. I had it too low. But the antenna peaking is fairly close. You see, it's just a little bit closer. I'm looking at it head on. It's just slightly to the left of the center between uh, 9 and 11. And of course, this depends on where you are in the band. If I go down to 3.5, 3.5, 
3.5 megahertz and I give this 3.5 megahertz I'm still there but now I've got a peak down here which is I mean it's debatable whether there's three there's four it's fairly close now the one thing about this uh, antenna tuner on the lower bands on the lower frequencies like 3.5 if I go to 3.1 There's 3.1 and I put the signal to 3.1 it's there but I have to peak it again now the lower you are in frequency the wider the span is so from 1.6 down here to 2 it's like a whole shift on lower frequencies you literally tune and peak tune and peak tune and peak whereas on the upper frequencies you don't need to do that so much sometimes you put it in one position and that's the peak as it is so in summary what we've got here is a perfectly RF aligned radio incredibly sensitive and the way I know that is because I compared it to two others that I did a full alignment or at least one of them I did a full alignment on and they are incredible receivers that is the satellite 3400 and the uh, Eton 750 which is like the satellite 750 this thing beats it which tells me that the uh, the IF alignment is good the first IF the second IF it tells me that everything is peaked the antenna circuits the RF circuits are peaked or optimized if they could go better I don't know but they're already better than the other receivers I've got so I'm not going to mess with it because I know that the chances of me making it worse are greater than the chance of me, of me making it better one thing I want to show you, and I don't know if you've noticed this, okay? One thing I was trying to do when I was testing sensitivity is I was trying to look at the S meter. Yeah, you're all looking at the S meter now, aren't you? And this thing is not a Sony CRF320 S meter. Oh no, this is not. And I've been looking at this thing for ages, a lot longer than you, and I only noticed it now. The reason I noticed it is because I was trying to measure the... Um, sensitivity or yeah sensitivity signal to noise ratio and so on which they give us and I was trying to measure that and I was trying to compare that to the result on the meter and it wasn't really corresponding very well and then I realized this meter is completely different to the original here's the original it's actually a Sony meter that comes in the Sony radio this thing's obviously been replaced and I looked on the inside the back is also different so this thing was replaced Good idea or not, I don't know. Something else I've noticed is that I put green LEDs on there and I believe, I believe they're white LEDs. I believe that on the original, this is not a green light and that is not a green light. I believe they used just white LEDs or white light on the, uh, on the meter and on the, radio, on the clock. But I have something up my sleeve. I've ordered uh, something and I want to replace these LEDs anyway. Not the concept, just the physical... Uh, mounting I'll show you that probably next week and so I needed to take these out in the, anyway so this will be a good opportunity for me to redo that normally I would need to bring the front plate off but because I want to change that one as well and that one is down here I'll need to remove the front cover again you get used to it it comes out rather quickly and uh, you become an expert at uh, removing knobs and putting knobs back so where are we right now we've got all the bands working We've got all the bands accurate. We've got all the bands sensitive. So the electronic restoration seems to be complete. I have a couple of things I need to do. The one is to implement that new solution that I have for the, uh, for the LEDs. It'll be uh, something I'll probably, as I said, do this week. I have to get the antennas and the antennas are going to require a little bit of 3D printing to fit these uh, new antennas or the replacement antennas. This one here. Let me just show you what this will look like. This is the antenna just loosely put in there. Now obviously it's not like the original. I really would have loved to have the push down and it pops up. I'm just wondering if this thing... Nah, it's not going to be able to do it. I did have a thought. These antennas have got... Let me show you what this looks like. This thing actually comes off.
and there's a thread there and there's a thread on the inside and it just screws onto the top. What this means is that if, if you had a, if you had the tools, you could actually make an aluminium plug that would fit perfectly in there. That would really make this thing disappear. But the only problem is how would you then pull it out? The way they found, I mean, theirs literally goes flush and then you just pop down and pops up. I wonder if one could implement one of those things on the inside to do that with a different head. I don't have a turning facility, a, a mill, so I can't do this. See, this is where I need to get Dave Tipton as my neighbor. Dave, you move to Madeira, the weather's better. I don't think Australia is good for me. If we had a, a mill here, we could literally turn a new, a new head for this thing that would fit in there. And then at the bottom, I would get one of those. You know, when you, when you have closets that you push in and it pops out and then you push in and it holds. That's exactly what this is. And there is space at the bottom. So one could sort of adapt one of those, um, one of those things to, to, yeah, I'm going ahead of myself. Not necessary. I'm not going to be doing it, but that's just an idea. So right now I am extremely happy. I've done a bit of touch-ups on the bodywork. The sides are on, the, uh, the bottom is on, the top is on. Everything has been cleaned so far. The only thing that's outstanding is the back. But as I said, I need to get into the back again. So I'll do that when I come to that. And I'm going to leave you for now because I've got a lot of um, shortwave listening to do. This thing is incredibly good picking up the amateur bands, picking up the SSB, upper side band, lower side band. I've been picking up stuff here on the, what is it, the CB bands? Is it 26.965 to 27.405 is the CB bands, if I'm not mistaken. And I've been picking up stuff there that I never picked up on the on the 750 or the, uh, the 3400 Grundex. So this thing is incredible. I'm having a lot of fun with it. I'm not minding that it's taking longer than usual because I get to play with it. And I'll get back to you soon with the final touch-ups and when the antennas arrive, I'll put it in and so on. For now, that's where I'm going to leave you and I hope you've enjoyed that. And um, if you have, click like, share, subscribe and all that jazz. And if you want to support the channel directly, please do so on Patreon. Once again, thanks for watching. Bye for now and stay safe.